day. My name's Adam Hawksby. I'm Deputy Director of Onward, and I'm joined by a, a fantastic panel this morning to talk about this issue of uh, remote working and what the future of work will mean for our places. Um, but before I introduce them, just a kind of quick word of, of context. So working from home is, is nothing new. There were many people working in a hybrid or a flexible way prior to March 2020. But when the pandemic hit, many people suddenly had to turn their their bedrooms, their back rooms, their, their bathrooms into an office and manage in a very different environment. And although that transition was really difficult for many people, actually a lot of workers recognized they quite liked some of the perks of flexible working. And that worried a lot of bosses in the UK and a lot of people who had relied on the status quo. I can promise you that there were a few nervous office managers in Birmingham when the remote worker visa was launched in Barbados. But Ultimately, the number of digital nomads is very low. Uh, Enrico Moretti did some research that showed that we'll know the number of people that could work from anywhere doubled during the pandemic and went from about 3 to 6%. And so there are 94% of people that will be tied to a place, whether that means they are going into an office once or twice a week, or if they work in hospitality or social care and need to be any particular place all of the time. And what this panel is really about is two questions. One, what's that equilibrium? What's that new normal going to look like? There are a lot of fairly radical ideas about moving to you know, entirely hybrid or entirely in the office, but where's that balance going to be found? But secondly, and probably most importantly, what should the response of politicians, of policymakers, of businesses, of civil society organizations be to that new normal? Because we know from previous transitions, if we're not intentional about how we respond to those changes, then we can get all of the downsides and none of the upsides. So that's what we're going to chat about today. Um, Will has talked you through the uh, poll, so please do have a look on Slido and share your views about what you think that new normal might be. Uh, but let me introduce my panel. So I'll start on my far right. Uh, we're joined by Ben Page, the chief exec of Ipsos Mori, the polling and public opinion company, uh, who has flown in specifically from uh, Davos uh, to be the very first person to change from Davos man to Halifax man. Uh, Indeed, indeed, uh, in less than, less than 12 hours. They have the direct route specifically uh, for him. Um, uh, to his left, we've got Sheila O'Neill. She's the Director of Regeneration and Strategy for Calderdale Council, kind of responsible for driving a lot of the strategies and approaches that have resulted in the fantastic uh, and thriving environment you see around you. Previously worked at Bradford Council, undertaking a similar role. Uh, to Sheila's left, we have Jason Stockwood from the Grimsby Alliance, a tech entrepreneur turn social entrepreneur, doing some fantastic work in Grimsby uh, to level up and regenerate that area, is also the co-owner and chair of Grimsby Town Football Club. And then to my right, Pete, uh, Pete Gladwell, who's the group social impact and investment director of legal and general, undertaking a huge amount of work to try and allocate pension funds and, and patient capital uh, to transformative regeneration projects around the country, and recently announced a four billion pound partnership uh, with Andy Street and the West Midlands Combined Authority as an example of some of the uh, power being operated at lower levels that Lisa talked about in her speech. So we're going to hear some fantastic remarks from the panel, but I believe we're initially going to open, uh, as is his trademark, with some slides uh, from Ben. Uh, a very brief death by PowerPoint, if I may. Indeed. Um, so my colleague, uh, Lauren, is going to put some slides up, pick a button, and we'll look at some... Uh, data and these will all be available on Create Streets numerous and uh, and Restitch's numerous uh, uh, social media channels. I'm sure. So, I just wanted to look at some of the data on this to remind ourselves of where we are as a country on this. And I think the first thing that's interesting is that if you look at different sorts of inequality, interestingly, the British are a bit less worried about misogyny uh, than other European countries, but much more worried about. Uh, Poverty, wealthy areas and, and, and poor areas. So it reflects some of the data. Um, we're all equally worried about overall inequality, uh, but actually geographic inequality is a particularly British concern in Europe, and I think that's a reminder of the need uh, to act. Let's go on. Next one. Um, and it's been around forever. Uh, so this was back in 2015. We need to rebalance the economy so it's not dominated by London. Next slide, please. Um, and, of course, when you look at who thinks Westminster is spending more or not getting their fair share, there are actually 35% in London who think they don't get their fair share. And there are poor bits of London, for those of you who are not from there, 
But nevertheless, you can see that as, as you go further away from London, and particularly to the north, uh, it feels more strong. It, that feeling is much stronger. Next slide, please. And of course, when you look at who uh, feels most left behind in terms of the amount of government spending, it is places like this uh, that identify themselves as um, feeling that the government is spending less here than it does everywhere else. Now, perception, reality, and I think one of the questions in this is what type of spending? Because actually, of course, some regions do get a lot of spending on welfare. It may be that particularly as we try to deal with, and this is a coming back from Davos, I think what was interesting was hearing the American Secretary of State for Trade talking in exactly the same terms as many of you are here about places that have been hollowed out effectively by globalization with jobs that have gone to other parts of the world and the need to reinvest in skills and industries uh, that will allow us to perhaps reshore some of our supply chain. We will also uh, friend shore, well, that's another word, our, our supply chain post Ukraine. But certainly places like this are feeling it strongly. Next slide, please. And of course, working from home, and I think this is a very good point. We need, it, it, the taboo against remote working is broken. We are too close to the trees to see the forest. I have, I've got thousands of people who've joined my organization all over the world, and they don't know what it's like to work in an office. They don't know actually what my company is like. Uh, and so, but nevertheless, uh, you know, we've got lots of people. It's not, it's not dropped. It's much higher than it was pre-pandemic. And, you know, in the same way that perhaps uh, the mayor of West Yorkshire might be saying, come here and work here remotely, the mayor of Venice is saying the same thing. Uh, the, mayor, the mayor of Bali says the same sort of thing. Uh, and I think there's some, there's some interesting questions. But as you've pointed out, Adam, most, you know, it's only a small proportion because people still value community and friends. And yes, I can go and live on a desert island and work remotely, but will I actually enjoy it? So, but nevertheless, places like Halifax start to become much more viable. And we at Ipsos are employing people in towns in Britain that we would have never have done before pan the pandemic because the technology now shows us it works, we can, they can be productive, and they can have a better quality of life, quite frankly, than commuting on a packed train for an hour and a half in the southeast. Next slide, please. Um, and of course, when you look at which cities are suffering, it, it, is, it is big cities. Uh, and, and the UK is particularly, um, uh, I suppose, an outstanding place in this sense, that we, our footfall has returned less quickly to our big cities than many other European or American uh, places. Uh, and I think that's, but that's partly, that's almost an opportunity in a sense, for, the, for better quality of life, which people say they experience with remote working, and some evidence of a bit more productivity. We need to be a bit moot about that. But certainly there's some opportunity here. Next. And then finally, I think, for everybody here, and I think what I find so, so wonderful about this conference is the fact that you've got people from different parts of the political spectrum at a time when our politics is fractious, when our, when our <laughs> politics is incredibly superficial, sometimes driven by the dark arts of people like me, if I'm brutally honest, who know how to package little messages, to tick your buttons and make you do things, when actually we need, as the British public acknowledge, a, an agreed cross-party strategy to deal with the geographic inequalities in this country. And they don't think it's going to happen in the next two or three years. Uh, they actually think it might happen in the next 20 years. But that will require everybody in this room and lots of very important people outside this room to start to agree on some solutions that are perhaps more akin to the solution we have reached on other tricky issues. Pensions, we've actually, we fixed with cross-party agreement a very difficult problem over pensions by basically getting people, forcing people to have them. We re the Conservatives reversed something Mrs. Thatcher introduced, which was the freedom not to have a pension. Now you're opted in, and, and it's been a brilliant policy success. But that's, cro that's cross-party agreement. We haven't got it on social care. Uh, maybe we can get it on this. Next slide, please. So, um, levelling up uh, is, is rising in prominence. Just click, click, click through this one. There you go, 48. Up to 66% of people have heard of it. The challenge is that this is the policy that people are least positive about for this government. Uh, I, but I wonder for any government what their ratings would be. <laughs> Next slide, please. And we are going to measure how uh, people feel across, across uh, Britain uh, that we are doing on the different dimensions the government's chosen. You can see that devolution is bottom. 
Whichever government is in power, it will be bottom. I challenge any new government coming in just to bite the bullet and do fiscal devolution, give some tax raising powers to localities. I don't think I'm going to live long enough to see it happen, but we'll see if the dial moves. And you can see skills uh, not doing so well, pride in place doing a bit better, and yes, internet, we've got the internet and we like primary schools, but some certainly R&D and investment, rebuilding our skills, rebuilding the industries we need, uh, pretty negative about that. So, the end. Next slide. Um, so I think, first of all, lots of opportunities in terms of making places attractive, but in the end it will be, uh, it's, it's going to have to be more than just knowledge workers battering away on laptops in interesting places. Next slide. Um, and of course, you know, some of the things we haven't talked about is the digitization of the economy is only just beginning. So some jobs, and this is a, a real issue for a global CEO like me with ravenous shareholders, um, I can now move lots of jobs to India, and there are brilliant graduates in India as well as in Halifax, and that is a problem with this technology. And so, last one, how do we get that cross-party consensus? Because if we can do, make a start today, that will be amazing. The end. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ben. So let's, let's turn them from the, the national and the macro through to the, the local and the micro. And, and Sheila, I'd be really curious to hear your reflections on that data and more broadly how you think the, the new patterns are working might impact on your area. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Great to see everybody here in Halifax. Um, I feel a little bit overstimulated, actually, just listening to Lisa. I wrote pages of notes that I wanted to talk about what Lisa had talked about. So back to kind of the topic here. Um, Tim picked up a lot of the things I wanted to talk about, Tim, the leader, Councillor which is good because it means that we're all kind of thinking the same things, we're working in the same direction and we understand what our priorities are. Um, I think in terms of how towns are, are, are affected by remote working and hybrid working, it's a really mixed picture. It's a mixed picture nationally and it's particularly a mixed picture across the borough. And I think Ben's point about the impact on big cities is, is true. I would not want the challenges that big cities have. I think Halifax and Colesdale has huge opportunities that we can build on and really grow the strengths that we have here and the, and the reasons why people want to make their lives here. I think one of the things that Lisa picked up on was around the, the nature of the investment that we have coming into the borough at the moment and, and across the country and the challenges that brings. And I, I spoke to Canon Barber this morning about how we work. I've, I've been in Calderdale since January last year. I joined during lockdown. Um, met a handful of staff in the first six months face to face and, and really I just meet people now. I was at an event yesterday, we are Calderdale. I had to keep putting my glasses on because I wear them when I'm on screen. No one recognises me without my glasses on. <laughs> so there's something about those personal relationships and how we get to know each other. But there's something about how we do the business that we're doing as well and how we work with partners and our community partners uh, as well as our private sector partners. And what we expect of them, so, so I keep seeing Stephen, I've spotted Stephen in the crowd from Todmorden Town Board. The, the delivery that we're doing and the change that we're experiencing in our town centres is not solely the responsibility of the public sector. We carry a heavy burden, I think it's fair to say, and we're not necessarily well equipped to deal with it at times, but we rely very heavily on our private sector partners and, and colleagues like Lloyds and RSA and Caveya and, and the health sector and Calderdale College are all absolutely critical to that jigsaw and, and knitting the fabric back together. But we also rely on, people, rely on people giving their time freely to make these programmes work, to get the investment where it needs to go. And there's a real disconnect there because the, the work that they have to do is very, it's very challenging. It's not easy. Not everybody can agree what they want to see. So Ben talked about some of the things that people prioritise. Some of the investment that we get doesn't necessarily marry up with what people want in communities. Um, we've also got a huge infrastructure deficit to deal with in the north. And when we talk about levelling up, what we don't want is to replicate some of the negatives that we see in the south. Who wants to get on a tube to work and be crammed in like a sardine on, in a can? We don't want that. We want really good quality, affordable transport systems. We want our hilltop villages to be connected to those transport hubs. We want people to be able to live good quality lives in good quality housing with good quality schools. And so we, we've got some young people here today. We had them at the event yesterday. And it absolutely is about the choice that they can make, that it is not a choice to leave, to live a larger life. The choice to stay can be an absolutely valid choice as well. And that's our responsibility collectively to make sure that people can make those choices. And I think your point about working in um, your bathroom and so on, that, that's right. You know, we, we shifted as a public sector at a pace that I think was absolutely incredible. I can remember in Bradford sending my teams home and the government made the announcement and we were up and running instantly. We've had to invest in technology across the, the, the borough in that with our staff team. But we had people who were working off ironing boards. We had people who had children to, to, to look after. 
that it's not an equality of, of being able to work at home. It's not a choice for everybody and it's not sustainable for everybody. So I think one of the things we need to be mindful of is that during the pandemic, we had a really high number of people across the borough who were not able to work from home because they were either in frontline services, they were working in retail, hospitality. So the luxury of choice is something that we need to be really mindful of. And that is part of the levelling up agenda, addressing those inequalities, addressing diversity, making sure we're inclusive. And I think that's something that has to be at the heart of how we deliver our town centres. I think it's, it's really important that we, we do not leave communities behind. And our town centres are not just for the people who live and work for, in them. They are for the people who live on the periphery and who need to connect into them for services and amenities. So I think there's, there's lots and lots of things I could go on to say. But I just do want to pick up on something Ben said about people joining during lockdown. We did a visit with the mayor of West Yorkshire to some of the businesses and we went across to Dean Clough and we met Kavea and we took Bella and, and, and Rowena, who are two inter interns who joined us during lockdown. And it was one of the most profoundly sad experiences of my career because Bella and Rowena have been fantastic. They joined the council, they threw themselves in, they've been so fantastic as part of the team. But they were devastated because Kavea were in the office, they had a really vibrant, lively energy about the place. They'd not had that. We've not been in the office and, and, and they miss that. They miss that connection, they miss that team, they miss that energy. I'm delighted Bella's got a permanent post with us and we'll experience some of that as, as we go to get to the new normal. Um, and we're hoping to help Rowena back when she's come back from the travelling. But it's <laughs> that connection and those, the, that opportunity to collaborate and what work looks like in the future. I think it's hybrid is not really well defined. And I think we've got to think about what we do with our time and what productivity looks like. So I'll, I'll leave it there if that's all right. Thank you very much, Sheila. It's bizarre to think you're attentional. <laughs> Ten years ago, you'd have told a story about giving a tour to interns of an office and them saying, this is fantastic. I'd love to be in this environment. You probably wouldn't have, have believed you. Uh, Jason, let's, let's, let's go to you, Jason. So, you know, you've worked nationally, internationally in kind of major tech companies and now uh, have kind of come back to Grimsby, working really close with the community there. So maybe share some of that perspective of both sides of this conversation about the future of work. Uh, firstly, thank you for inviting me today. Thanks to Onward in general for sort of holding the intellectual framework for some of this work. I've really enjoyed years um so yeah i actually feel quite conflicted by this conversation i um in 2018 i wrote a book on the future of work and technology um and, it, and really you know i talked about championing autonomy you know uh, self-expression freedom to choose on projects and working from home uh, and the big determinant of that was a really strong culture so you know that book that book was quite prescient in some way and, and so what's yeah, yeah, it's still available on Amazon, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, <laughs> yeah um, four stars. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it's, um, you know, the tech, the tech business that I left four years ago had 800 people in it. And when COVID hit, it was able to migrate instantaneously, not just because of the technical solutions, but because we had the strong sense of culture in that organisation. Now, so that takes years to build, and that's not the classic model of the capitalism that we built over the last 50 years or whatever. It's interesting hearing the Moretti quote, this economist, about that, you know, talk to 6% of people. Um, because that's, that's, that's when COVID played out. You know, I was sat at home, um, I'm, I'm from Grimsby, I lived in London for 25 years whilst I travelled. And I live near Stockport now because my wife's from Stockport and I have no children. Um, but actually, <laughs> you know, what, what happened in, during COVID, like many of us in sort of middle class world now, we're sat there in our nice homes, actually quite enjoying spending time with my kids quite a lot. Um, plenty of space. And I thought about the kid that I grew up as when I was seven. You know, I'm a council estate kid, um, you know, product of the welfare state, free education, free housing, you know, free, um, free school meals, etc. And when we were all clapping that we were in it together, I just thought that was complete nonsense. It really animated me and aggravated me because, you know, the people that were keeping our economy alive had no choice to stay at home. The kids in council houses had no technology. They've had no access to the provisions that were needed to, to keep their education going. And then also, you know, and this is not spoken of quite a lot, like I've got a lot of mates who are tech entrepreneurs and people who, um, you know, I grew up skinned to them. I'm unfortunately not that now, but the guys that I know that are financiers or in the economy building tech companies, um, all their tech stocks were rising, you know, as, we've, as we all migrated online, as people sat home just getting wealthier as well. So um, it's all broken, as Lisa said earlier. So I'm really animated by that question you know if you come from the sort of background I come from and you end up in the position I'm in today is how can you be useful how can you help I think there's a moral obligation um, to do something about that so so the conflict are, oh by the way and I'll tell you a quick story so I went to a, I get invited to all these tech events and 
And one of them I went to was, um, it's, it's really, it's, it's the least inclusive environment in the world. It's very selective. It's, it's usually very wealthy people. And, it, and in private, there's a guy at a, a supermarket that will remain nameless, for obvious reasons, for legal reasons, um, <laughs> just spoke about like, how they want to automate their business and have no people in it. You know, so if you think about the ravenous shareholders that Ben spoke to there just a moment ago, that's what they want. They want high productivity. In a lot of cases, don't want jobs. So, you know, while we're talking about levelling up, there's a new wave of technologies that are coming that genuinely can offer us a world of abundance if we make the right choices, as opposed to stuck in this, this shareholder primacy trap that, that has to be, the beast that has to be fed. So that's a whole other debate maybe for another day. But So the conflict I feel in this debate is who, who benefits from the working home discussion, you know, to that three to six percent. And it's the analogy is with capitalism, right? Because the last 50 years, globalization of capitalism has won. It's worked, right? There's nearly two billion people out of poverty, but they're mainly in India and China. Yeah. So it's great. It absolutely is the model that we need to double down on in some way. Um, but at the same time, there's been losers. The losers have been people in my hometown that I love Grimsby, right? 66,000 people of working age. Um, but those jobs have migrated to retail, to manufacturing, to jobs that, quite frankly, um, I'm really fortunate. I've just ended up a fellowship at Oxford with the, with the economist Carl Frey. And Carl Frey wrote a paper in 2016 about the jobs that will be automated. Well, guess what? The jobs that have replaced the fishing industry are the jobs that are going to be automated as well. So we've got this power. That's why we're talking about the middle class arbitraging their £300,000 bed sit in London to buy you know, a massive home in Grimsby. That's great. But you know, it's not going to be great for the long term unless it benefits everybody. So. Um, so we definitely need, by the way, I'm a technologist as well, so the paradox in what I'm saying is that we need these high-tech jobs, we need these pro productivity gains. It's absolutely critical. But what we do with the benefits of that, what we do with the wealth that's created is act equally as important as we build a social fabric. The things that we've lost, the things that I lost in an international career, feeling connected to the community, to the people that I love, the people I care about in whatever dimension of life. So I was at the launch of... Um, you might know this, uh, there's, a, there's a phenomenal company called Orsted that's built the world's biggest wind farm off the coast of Grimsby. It goes live in a few weeks. I was at the launch there last week. 10% of the UK's energy will come from that renewables. It's an amazing effort by brilliant people doing wonderful work. That company has 20 apprentices. You know, so they, they, you know, it's not going to be the thing that changed the trajectory for 66,000 people. It's needed, it's vital, it's absolutely critical as we transition to a new economy. At the same time, it won't solve the whole problem. So, you know, and it's interesting you mentioned Moretti because Moretti is also the economist that talks about local multipliers. So with these high-tech jobs, there is a strong economic theory that you create three to five other jobs by creating those high-tech jobs. But again, it's how we bring people, everyone into the economy to make it more productive. So, you know, regeneration only works if it works for everybody. You know, regeneration, I like the analogy from nature. The leveling up agenda, as beautiful as it is, is linear one way and often talks about you know, the progress that people want to see from white. And this is why the onward work is vital. The leather up white paper, when it talks about renewing the social fabric, is absolutely critical. Because we've also got to re 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 redefine what, um, what, what we do as a species as well. It's not just about economic productivity, it's about human flourishing as well. So there's three things we're trying to do. And, you know, uh, and again, well, only time will tell whether this is work. But one thing is trying to rebuild the institutions that bind us connect us across non-party political lines. So we bought the football club because we care about football and you know we care about beating Wrexham tomorrow in the playoff finals, even more than that. Thank you for those that are Grimsby fans. That's none. I won't make a comment <laughs> about <laughs> Halifax. <laughs> Halifax unfortunately went out. I was glad they didn't win because it'd be awkward to be here today <laughs> really playing them. But you know those institutions, Grimsby Town Football Club is a 144 year old institution that across any divide people love and identify with that football club. So we're trying to reset the values and rebuild that institution for the modern area whilst respecting the past. Second thing is, you know, we're trying to raise aspiration and hope in the town. You know, if you're a seven-year-old me on a council estate and the only recommendation school could give someone who's a school leader with no qualifications is join the army, I'm not sure I would have fulfilled my potential to build you know, billion-dollar companies and be a fellow at Oxford today. So, you know, how do we raise real investment and hope in the kids in our town, so we're building an on-site youth zone for kids, but there's a number of initiatives uh, in the town as well. And then the third one is we need to invest in R&D, and that's why I love the, the tax breaks that the government's giving. That's why I love the Orsted story. And we need to in invest in the green industries, but make sure the benefits of that work for everybody. So I'll finish there. As you can tell, I could go on. 
and um, but I really appreciate the opportunity to be here so thanks to Omnia again for their great presentation <laughs> Thanks so much, Jason. I don't know what it says about the two conferences, but on Tuesday, people didn't clap each individual speaker. So that's why I'd slightly thrown out my timing, but take from that what you will. Um, Pete, to, to come to you next. So, you know, when, when trying to work out which of these trends are going to predominate, where people are going to move, where people are going to work, it's often said, you know, look where the markets are going, right? Look where people are putting their money, where the bankers and the investors are going, because they're really having to put something on the line. So as someone that thinks about where to allocate massive amounts of Capital, what, what are your thoughts on where some of these trends will land and what, what areas should be doing? Yeah, I, I think I might have turned up at the wrong conference because we are the, the shareholder that has been referred oh, to yeah. as times. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but actually, in some ways, that's the paradox of this. That, that is why this discussion is so important and actually why it's so important that the likes of the LNGs and the Lloyds are engaged in this because, you know, Ben referred earlier to uh, auto-enrollment of pensions you, almost all of you, may, maybe not all of you, but a considerable number of you in this room, I would, I would guess at least half, have probably given at least some of your pensions and savings to LNG and are relying on us to pay your pension when you retire until you pass away. So uh, the key point to note in all of this is you have agency and when you choose who stewards your pension or who stewards your savings and which product you put it in, you are actually influencing the very decisions uh, we're talking about on the stage. I mean, it's come up twice, I don't know if you've noticed that already, that these shareholders are affecting, social, uh, have major social implications for what goes on in the UK today. So I think that's the first, you know, so LNG, as I say, stewards 1.4 trillion of society's money. Um, why, why are we interested in this? Um, I, I think, you know, there's, there's both a personal conviction from several of us and a, the reason several of us have ended up working in the same company is it's become something of a corporate conviction um, that those pensions and, and savings should be reinvested for good back in people's areas. Um, and our, our social role is both to provide people with financial security, but also actively, proactively, intentionally throw effort into how we can use people's pensions and savings for good. So, you, you know, you mentioned supermarkets. Part of what that looks like for us is actively engaging with Sainsbury's, and I can ma name them. <laughs> uh, they weren't, I think, who you were referring to, but actively yeah, engaging with Sainsbury's about paying a living wage for all of their employees in London and, and a proper London living wage uh, because that is really important to us that actually that has a direct implication on health inequality, for example. So that's just one example of engaging as a, as a shareholder but trying to force... Uh, a kind of more thought through and holistic agenda that benefits the very people whose pensions and savings we're, we're stewarding. What does it look like in this environment? Well, you know, for us, the key question and th is the question of this conference and the question Lisa was grappling with earlier is that what society can't look like is a few of us sat in an office in London guessing what Grimsby needs and deciding we might go there one day, but we'd like it if they came to us, really. Um, and <laughs> having a nice meeting and then hoping Grimms is going to sort its problems out and we never need to go there. The first visit I made after lockdown was to Grimsby. We met the leaders, the mayor, the local authority, representatives of the freemen, I'm sure people who you know very well. Um, but the whole aim was a real fact-finding mission. What's the vision of Grimsby? What's the ambition for the place? And how can long-term investment support that vision? Bearing in mind the good people of Grimsby, many of them will have entrusted their pension savings to us how do we create that virtuous circle? It was another reason we commissioned Demos, the, the think tank, to do a lot of research. We, we interviewed 20,000 people as we were coming out of the pandemic on this specific topic. What will the future of towns and cities look like, bearing in mind these kind of remote working trends? Um, and the interesting takeaways were thankfully very similar to yours, Ben, that this can be a real force for good in places. We can see increased prosperity in places, uh, we can see a devolution of spending, um, and, but, but there are key, key calls that I'm sure we'll want to come on to mm. that policymakers can use to either harness that or let that opportunity slip away. Um, but that's really important. To start, you know, the, one of the key things that I'll never forget is actually people's pride in place is distinctly linked to having good local shops. So whether you like it or not, you know, in the real estate industry, there's this, there's this view that retail is dead. Actually, if you care about what people want from their places, and reinvesting in their places, 
investing in the right type of retail, Bad retail still is becomes dead. important. Good retail. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, th these are the kind of things we're, we, are gr we are grappling with. Th just to get to, after a very meandering uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. introduction to answer your question, yeah. I think the one thing I want to, to leave you guys with and, and would welcome further discussion is, actually, we don't really believe in following the markets. And, and, and when you're investing at the kind of scale that we try to and should be doing, and the four billion partnership with the West Midlands is a good example of this, what we're increasingly convinced by is that places can shape their own destiny with the right partnership. And, you know, you will meet many people in the city of London who spend a lot of time trying to predict where the market is going and then piggybacking off that. Actually, the encouragement I'd leave you all with is, you know, LNG alone stewards 1.4 trillion, and that is just one company. Lloyds are here. They've got plenty of cash. Uh, then there are plenty of other people with plenty of other cash as well. The key is how we as a society tap into that for social and economic benefit in a more effective way, but that drives social justice and has an impact in places like Grimsby and uh, Calderdale, as well as uh, the, the big cities and, and the Londons and the, the South East of Britain. I feel like I should do some sort of other large institutional investors are available disclaimer I've done uh, that. after I've done that. that for you. After I that pitch, Lloyd's I appreciate five. it. <laughs> <laughs> the two sponsors we have. Um, so let's then move on to a couple of questions. I want to give plenty of time for, for folk in the audience to jump in, but I've just got two, one, one for Ben and then one for Sheila. So, so Ben, you talked about you know, mayors in Venice and Bali and Barbados kind of making a pitch for workers to spend some of their time. They're either digital nomads or if it's in the UK, mayors of you know, West Yorkshire and other areas saying this is a good place to do your two or three days working from home. What does a good pitch look like? So what does your work tell you, workers, when they're thinking about relocating, what do they want? And then, Chiro, I want to ask you kind of how your... Well, it's the same thing that. as people living there want, of course. They want uh, you know, affordable housing and, and obviously space, which is one of the things that's distinctive in the housing market at the moment. They also want a community. They need, they need decent shops. It's, it's a decent transport infrastructure. So they, they don't, I mean, I think, and I think one of the reasons why actually so few people have gone to some of the more remote destinations is actually people still need, we're, we're, we're monkeys, right? So we want, we're social animals. So they, they and, and just dropping into a place where you have no connection at all, you need to know that there will be people like you, which is for some of those places, actually, there is a bit of that. But um, it's, it's not, they don't want something completely different from the people who are already there. Uh, it's more, and actually, the attractiveness, if there's, if there's already a, a, an effective community, affective and effective, then that, that, that will really help the place. And some great physical infrastructure like the building we're in today. And, and Sheila, Lisa talked about young people that are, that are leaving places, you know, we talked about attracting people. How do you think about either bringing more workers into Calderdale or making sure that young people can stay here and can thrive? It's all the same things. You, you know, we're, we're not a different beast, really. But I think one of the things that's really important is is that skills agenda mm -hmm. and, and how we support businesses to get to a place where they understand the skills they're going to need in the future. We have a, a really high number of small businesses and, and micro businesses finding the time for them to be able to plan what their future looks like, what their business needs, what's happening. We've got some big players as well. We've got Turberg who are leading on the battery um, for large vehicles and mm -hmm. so on, electric vehicles. Um, we've got lots of big players around the borough, but, but we've got lots and lots of individuals and small businesses who don't have time to lift their head up and think about what does it mean for their employees, what does it mean for their business. For us, we're doing everything we can. We're doing all the things that, we, that councils were doing previously around the one public estate agenda. We've rationalised our estate, we've invested in it, we've got really good quality offices. Um, we've invested in technology, as I've said, so that staff can work remotely and they can work more in a more mobile way. Um, but I'm recruiting for a senior post at the moment, and I was talking to colleagues this, this week that the first question all of the potential candidates are asking me is, how do you work? Um, what is it like being in Calderdale? It's not that they don't want to come to Calderdale, they don't find it an attractive location, but they want to weigh up, actually, how many days do you want me in the borough? Mm -hmm. Is it somewhere I want to relocate to? And so that whole package has become much more important. And it's a real opportunity for us because we can attract people from a much broader geography than previously. But in the same way, people can come and live here. So we've got great connectivity to Leeds and great connectivity to Manchester and their, their economies. It needs to be better. And that investment in rail infrastructure is really key. But investment in buses and mass transit is really key for us. And they're the things that make a difference to people. How do they get about? What does life feel like in a place like Calderdale? And it shouldn't feel left behind. I don't think we are left behind. I think we're very well placed. I, the only thing... Uh, 
I've been pondering this for the last week, is I get the transport infrastructure, but of course, ultimately underpinning all of that will be a skills and industrial strategy that I think in Britain, and I don't know, there are many, and I see Andy Haldane just walked in, there are many far more articulate and intelligent people than me in this room. I'm not sure that we have that skills and industrial strategy that, that Britain needs, actually. Mm -hmm. And if, if, if a cross-party consensus could be reached on what that was, it would be amazing. I'm, uh, unfortunately, I'm not always optimistic. And I think I was reading some of the output from Davos this yeah, week and, I mean, and around that attracting and returning people and that, that radical flexibility in work that needs to happen. And I think that is something that we really need to work with partners. We don't have a university in the borough. We need to work with other university towns and cities. Um, and our college is key, but we've got some great schools. Our relationship with the schools in the borough is fantastic. We've got some really engaged young people, very strong views about what they want from their life and what they think that the borough can be. So I think you, you're absolutely right. Schools and the, the industrial strategy is, is so important for a place like college. Jason, let me bring you in, then we'll go to some questions. Yeah, I'm, I, I think why, why this is problematic is exactly that, right? Because actually we've got... There's a bigger question about purpose, and human flourishing in there as well. So the skills agenda is one thing, and it's vital. But then again, the knotty problem in there is that we're building the skills agenda for now and for the next 10 years, and the technical wave we're going to come and live through in the next 20 is going to disrupt all of that. Mm -hmm. So again, in Grimsby, we built a skills uh, agenda around retail, around manufacturing, and guess what? Those jobs are going to go away. So again, this is why I've got nothing but respect for politicians and people trying to think about industrial strategy because we've got to we've got to eat today while thinking about the world we're going to live in tomorrow as well. And I think this is why it's really problematic. But it's a bigger question about what we want from our lives beyond our economic productivity. I think we get too narrow into a conversation mm. about it's vital, but it doesn't tell the whole story. Yeah. And the key is going to be how we bring all of those interventions together, right? Around transport, around skills, around community. And as we've said. This morning, it's very difficult, now impossible, to do that from Whitehall, which is why it's even more depressing, Ben, to see in your slides that devolution is where the public are <coughs> least positive about progress but being the made. Pro and, the, and the challenge on that is that although co people consistently for the last 40 years have said they want more devolution, yep. when you let, then when you start talking about actually letting your local unitary authority have complete control over council tax, yep. They start to get anxious, if I'm brutal, and that's partly why it hasn't happened. But we need to be, somebody needs to be brave. Can I just, make, just I'm, I'm genuinely not trying to pitch my book, although it's pretty <laughs> Available on Amazon, uh, still on Amazon. Four stars. Okay. But mm -hmm. actually, in the book, I talk about, rather than think about a solution and trying to, yeah. trying to map a, a linear route towards something, the businesses that survive are the businesses that have real resilience, yes. trust, and agility in them. And that's why it was so important in the Leveling Up White Paper to talk about rebuilding the social fabric. Because whatever future mm -hmm. comes at us, and we genuinely don't know really, the ability to be connected into each other and into our humanity is the thing that will help us to embrace whatever yeah. that is. So again, while we're trying to think about productivity and, and find the answer, not, but if we build that resilience in our communities, whatever comes at us, we'll be in a position to, to face it. Excellent. Okay, Actually, let's sorry, can I just come back on Ben's point? Because you can, I no problem. It's really important to remember, not all councils are cr created equal. Um, so devolution means different things to different places. If we're reliant on our council tax rates, rates and our business rates, we, we need to have a, p a place where we can transition into a much higher value economy, I think. There we go. No one else can jump in? Well, I, I'll pick her <laughs> off. <that. laughs> on, I just Pete. think what Sheila said there is absolutely vital. You know, uh -huh. people make this um, really simple area. It, we literally, we took talking to someone in the government about this yesterday, where people just think investors want to invest in rich places is the kind of caricature and oh, given a, a choice we'd all just head to Surrey and you know buy some build some yuppie flats actually if you look at our track record and again this isn't about LNG's track record but it's just where we've had the most success it's been local authorities and mayors who can work collaboratively and say here's the need for investment locally here's the ambition of where we want to place the, the place to go to now how do we work collaboratively with those of you who steward society's pensions and savings deliver on that goal. Mm -hmm. But that requires serious amounts of uh, ambition. It requires serious amounts of capacity at a local level as well. And, and you know, combined authority, local authority working seamlessly. And just some places are much better at it than others. And there's no denying that. So that, that, that is a bit of a challenge for central government as well. How do you put the resource in at that level to enable more of this to come through? Build that institutional capital that they spoke about in the yeah. leveling up white paper. OK, let's, we've got about 10 minutes for some questions. Uh, and so I'll take them in kind of groups of a, a couple. <laughs> Um, we do not have roving mics, so just project, please. Um, so we'll go uh, one in the middle just here to start.
fantastic question. Okay, let's gather a couple more. Um, so I'll go with the one just on the edge over there. Yeah. Speak up a little bit for me, please. Okay, excellent. So on the tacit learning and development that you need in offices, uh, and we'll go for a question just up there, manager check chat. I'm, re I'm really sorry, can I? <coughs> of course, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's, so just people that might not have heard those three questions, we've got one uh, from Amy on the global responsibilities when we think about where we work. We've got one from uh, Sarah on tacit learning and development in the office, how do we maintain that? And then one from uh, Mike on Sorby Bridge and manufacturing, what the role of kind of particular industrial assets might be when we think about where and how we might work. Uh, I'll direct these questions to members of the panel, but please do feel to jump in. I feel, given we have our a kind of resident Davos man, I've got to come to you on the global <laughs> considerations issue. Yeah. So, so Ben, on this, when we're thinking about where people might work, uh, how do we think about kind of offshoring and moving some of those responsibilities well, it, abroad? It, it's a, a, a number of things are going on. So offshoring is going to continue because um, basically the demands of, of of, sh of shareholder organizations, even if they're benign pension funds, are they, they want to invest in high-performing companies. And so one of the ways I can improve profitability is to use more graduates in India than graduates in Britain, very, very crudely and sadly, that that's a sort of fact of life. However, I think the events since the 24th of February, with the West um, now coming together in a way that we probably wouldn't have predicted if we'd been doing this conference a year ago, and then things like the... Uh, you know, attempts to look at, really now look at supply chains, which before people hadn't, they just assumed it all worked somehow. Now there's intense scrutiny on that. Mo many Western countries who've seen this hollowing out of places like this uh, sh absolutely share the same agenda. It's exactly the same. If you, this, we could be somewhere in the United States having the same conversation. We could be somewhere else in, inside the European Union having the same conversation. My only, I say, my question is, if we're going to see Russia, the, the Russia and Chinese world seal themselves off, and it's, you know, none of this is necessarily going to be good, but the West is going to have to look at friend shoring, as Janet Yellen puts it. We aren't going to, we, I don't think we should go for autarky and try to make absolutely everything we need inside the UK, because mm -hmm. we, we can't, quite frankly. But how the West will have those conversations and, and agree, sort between itself with friendly competition, must be part of the answer. Uh, but again, do our international institutions allow it? You tell me. Um, Jason, let me come to you on this question of tacit learning and development. And I've, I've heard you speak before about not just kind of learning some of the hard skills, but also the role of 
kind of role models, aspiration, the soft skills that you might get from a work environment. So how do you think about the role of offices or, or physical spaces in making sure people can learn and develop? Yeah, the honest answer is no one knows. I mean, that's, we're, in a, we're in a brave new world of thinking about if you, even cultures that have been had that sort of flexibility historically are adjusting to this. So what's great is that we've had this acceleration of businesses that didn't think about home working, that didn't think about flexibility, being forced to do it. So it's become the new normal in that regard. I think the businesses, I mean, I'm an investor in 40 businesses directly and probably in the top 100. The businesses are doing well of actually asking the question and talking to people in every dimension of their organisation about what they want and what they need. And we are losing some stuff by working from home. And mm. I, think, I think there's a good debate in the business that I'm seeing now is saying, no, how does it work for everybody? And some examples of that is there are, there are ways in which people decide explicitly when they're going to be in the office. It's not the sort of thing where you wake up every day and decide where you want to be. So you know that you can be deliberate about activities on those days as well. And some of it might not be economically productive. It might be the stuff that is... No, you've got to work. make people go to offices on one or two days a week. N n end of. Discuss. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> That's, uh, I'd, I'd I'm going to very neatly move <laughs> away from that uh, because that could. No, just, just quickly. Very yeah, early. Go on, Jason. It's an important point. It's right? really a serious problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, don't, I don't believe that's to be Dutch. Okay. To be true. I, okay. I believe it to be you need to create the space yeah. for people to do the stuff you need when you're younger on in your career to learn from people. It doesn't need to be an office. So, businesses I spun up um, a couple of years ago, we decided that once every quarter we're going to live together. I mean, not for everybody. This obviously. may be a radical solution. <laughs> yeah, okay, right. Right. Can you imagine like small groups in offices going, let's have an intense experience where yeah. we, we learn about each other, we support each other, see our different styles. And it might not be work for everyone, but it could be, if it is in an office, you could design no, I don't a, think couple it's a, a couple of days a week yeah. where you are in there, but for other reasons rather than churning out task orientated stuff. So I think it's a great debate yeah. to have, and I think it could at least be cross-generational to be relevant and, and precise. So let me, uh, Shira, I want to bring you in both on this question, but also the question about of manufacturing and industrial assets you know you've led economic development in bradford now in call today how do you think about the role that manufacturing and industry might have in that future economy just picking up on that tacit learning and, and so on it's been a real struggle for us and, and particularly in technical roles like planning and engineering and so on where they've missed that on-site and hand holding if you like um, and that's something that we're working really hard on at the moment and it, it, it's been difficult as i said for the interns just in terms of making those connections and one of the things I was, I was reading about was around conflict on virtual meetings and it's very difficult to resolve conflict and so it kind of lingers and you don't get to a point of resolution on tricky issues which then isn't helpful for the business whatever kind of business you're in um just on on the it goes back to the skills issue as well there's the the um manufacturing issue mm -hmm. we've got lots of manufacturing you're absolutely right and we've got some really advanced manufacturing in the borough as, as dr um, mike gray who i speak to the other week actually i think didn't mike yeah um it's not that <laughs> it, I, I, it, it wasn't me that asked him the question i have to say but um but, it, but it's it's we're, we're feeling our way aren't we really you know we're feeling our way as a public sector it's not our comfort zone and businesses have got their heads down as i said before um we've got as part of the big the Brig House Towns Fund program, we've got an industry for bid in there. And that really is about identifying how we work with businesses, how we get them to expand their horizons, work differently, introduce new technologies, become more efficient but grow. And then how do we make that scalable and replicable so that other industries can pick it, other manufacturing businesses can pick it up and learn. And it's about attracting people to those industries as well. One of the things that I think I found across both Calderdale and, and across my time in Bradford is that people don't know what happens in manufacturing businesses. They think it's messy and dirty and horrible. I've been in some of the businesses, both, both here and in Bradford, that are incredibly high tech, absolutely spotless. It's like being in a, a surgical ward. You know, you just, it's, it's not the world that people think it is. So we've got work to do with our schools, with our colleges and with parents. Because this is a, a, an issue that, that starts early in life, isn't it? About what people's expectations of careers are. And we talked previously about apprenticeships where people thought vocational apprenticeships were somehow lesser than having a, a degree route to, to, um, to work. So th there's lots of work to be done. And I think leadership needs to come from government. Resource needs to come from government. And our skills agenda needs to be much more joined up and knitted together than it is at the moment. It's easy for it to get fragmented. Our business support systems get fragmented very quickly. Um, so working with a combined authority and government is absolutely key on that agenda. Uh, we are going to have to wrap up there. But let me just... Of course, she, gets, she looks mortified by the fact you've done that. Um, <laughs> Uh, but <laughs> of course you can, yeah, please go ahead.
let me come to you on that question, Pete, because you, you kind of think about kind of next generational living and some of the investments you make. So how do you think about this question of balancing the interests of uh, new jobs for young people and opportunities with um, kind of older population and what they might need? So yeah, please. yeah. So as I say, a big part of our role in society is paying pensions and enabling people to do exactly what you've, what you've talked about. There's also a really important need for investment in later living to enable people, for example, to downsize, to get into homes that are more suitable them, for them, that frees up more, uh, more accommodation elsewhere. So that's another big thrust for us as, as a, something that's both a good idea financially and there's a real social need for it. I think the thing, do you mind me just, it, it, no. the, the, the question maybe ties into the discussion even better than you necessarily have realized, though maybe you, you, you spotted the link already. But the key thing for me in all of this as well is, as a com country, we have major strengths that we're playing to. And, you know, our knowledge economy and our university is a classic example, particularly in, in answering some of those previous questions. But the key thing for us is, how do you not just enable that strength to grow, but also make that growth as inclusive as possible. Mm -hmm. So the big partnership we have with Oxford University is about enabling that university to thrive and drive local economic growth. But it's also housing for the workers who help the university to thrive, much more affordable housing, and as you say, later living. And, and so that, that is the big challenge. And we only tackle that when we think holistically it work. Bradford will never be the success it could be without Bradford University. And, and thinking about how we make that growth inclusive rather than just a few sectors striding ahead uh, and then the rest of society struggling to catch up. So that's a really big, important challenge, I think, for us as well. Thank you, Pete. Uh, and so, um, I'm really sorry, we oh. do need to wrap up there. Thank you to, to all the panel. <laughs> Clearly much more that can be said, but a conversation that went from the global, the local, the young to the old, but really talked about the fundamentals. How do we get connectivity, local leadership, community?